Hi everyone, and welcome to Words and Music. My name is Loretta Alabans. Today on the show, I speak to Carl Westerberg, better known by his stage name Manila Luzon, American drag queen, recording artist, and reality television personality. Best known for his appearance in competing in the third season of RuPaul's Drag Race and the first and fourth season of RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars. I decided to catch up with Manila Luzon to find out what is keeping him busy during the pandemic and tea worthy stories on Michelle Visage's absence during the 2016 tour of the Battle of the Seasons Extravaganza Tour. So let's take a listen to our conversation. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. And how about yourself? Fantastic. You look great. Oh, you know, just not wearing pants though. So <laughs> nothing. Things are pretty cool here in in, uh, in Los Angeles. Okay, is it what everyone says? They're not wearing pants during these Skype interviews. Well, I'm a drag queen, so I got a full you know sequin gown underneath this with high heels and fishnet stockings for sure. Is that your trophy room? Oh, this is, I'm in my I'm in my drag room or my, my my drag closet. At some point during our conversation, let us see your drag wardrobe. Oh no no no! It's, this is the only like clean corner of my drag room. What's keeping you busy, Manila? I have been spending the last month or so in the mode of waiting this thing out. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Once the lockdown started happening back in March, um, all of my drag gigs, I, mean, I travel for my, my gigs, um, most of them, all of them were either postponed or canceled. So then we moved to a digital, you know, live digital shows, which is a lot of fun because, you know, like everyone is starting to get into the idea of doing like FaceTimes and Zoom calls and Skypes. And um, it's all like a very different experience um, without the interaction of the fans, without the without the exchange of energy. So it's a different it's a different thing. But now it's like I'm realizing that there's no end in sight for this. I've kind of just been you know chilling out a little bit and actually using this time as a as a much needed break because you know after I was on RuPaul's Drag Race and. But several, a few times, and uh, because of it, I've been traveling um, around the world, doing shows um, all over, um, shooting commercials, TV shows, uh, being on this, you know, cameo on that, cameo on this, and so, um, and I've been doing it for a really long time, and, and it, I'm just like, God, I need a break. So, I'm taking this as like a nice sign from God to like just sit down. And uh, I'm kind of like, get to focus on other things besides my drag. Um, Although I do, you know, I'm still doing my drag and it's like everywhere still. It's funny that you say that, that, you know, we all could take a pause for a moment. You know, I feel like I should always be working on something. I should always be doing something. I like being, I like to keep myself busy with projects. I'm an artist, so I like to create. Um, But, you know, as an artist, sometimes you need to like, to like once you like get all those creative juices out you need to kind of you know regrow that energy with inside yourself and because i was doing so much drag for such a long time because i was on drag race like 10 years ago um so i've been doing you know drag you know at the highest exposure in the world you know with drag race um being able to like sit down and like take some time for myself and kind of like recharge it has been very, 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 very nice. Um, and the thing about it's great about it is that like the whole world is experiencing uh, this pandemic in some way. So there's no guilt that I feel like uh, that I have to be doing something. I have to be accomplishing something because there's like no one's doing anything really. Like no one's really getting to accomplish the things that they want to do. So I'm learning how to like take a slower pace and, you know, you know, kind of absorb the the little things a little bit more, you know, get into like the stop and smell the roses as they say. I totally get it. I totally understand that because, you know, we are suffering the same feat as well, Manila. 
you know, we're doing a lot of shows, you know, it's the constant need of, you know, to do something, to put a show on sale, to do the promotions, to do the advertising, to keep the online community engaged. And thus, the fact came this whole idea for us as a promoter to say, how are we going to feed our fans now that we have no shows to promote? And thus, Manila came this idea for words and music. You know, it's a different time now. And um, I feel like a lot, we've spent a lot of energy like establishing ourselves in a certain way. But now the whole world has been turned upside down. And, you know, now it's like up to us to find the new creative ways to, to be entertainers, to be who we are. Um, and it's a completely different pace of life now. Um, you can't really plan ahead too much. So, um, but the one thing that's really good is like, a, you know, a little bit of, you, you don't have to have it as spectacular anymore. You know what I mean? Like it can be a little bit more subdued. It can be a little bit more like, you know, from your home. I would have never imagined having this conversation with you. I'm really grateful for it that, you know, we could, you know, do this and, you know, a whole new paradigm. It's up to us to kind of uh, figure out new ways, uh, to, you know, to to do the things that we like, which is really cool because drag queens, honestly, um, especially, I feel like they have, they're always good at that. You know, they, they're, we're used to taking trash and making it into like, you know, million dollar outfits and, uh, you know, we also don't take ourselves seriously. So like, you know, if we have to do, you know, a, a, a live digital drag show in our, you know, pajamas, you know, from our living room, it's, that's kind of fine. Like that's like a new way of performing. Um, so I guess it's, it's kind of different. And, and, you know, like in the beginning, it was, it was definitely hard for sure, because, you know, also like I'm, you know, as a, as a person who's out in the public, I mean, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like a huge movie star, but like, you know, I still have like a lot of, you know, people like that, like strangers that, you know, follow me and, and whatever. The, the first thing that was kind of like scary for me was, um, you know, filming and, and doing these live things and showing myself from my own home, because to me, it's, that's like my private space that I get to like go back to. Um, after I, you know, I'm like in on, on stages, you know, on sets uh, and whatever, I, I can come back and just kind of be in my home. Um, so that's something I had to get over, but I'm, I'm over it now. And I also think that, you know, watching any kind of uh, like talk show on TV that's still kind of going on, like everyone's like doing Zoom calls and, and, and that kind of vibe. So now I think that like, Okay, we're we're used to seeing our celebrities are uh, you know in their their own hair and makeup. You know, it's it's a little different. So I, I feel like honestly, drag queens still have a head up. Uh, you know, they're a leg up on 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 real actual like movie stars who are used to like sitting in a makeup chair and having some like you know talented people do their hair and wigs and makeup for them. Now now it's like oh okay, well uh, you know Char Charlize Theron. You know, it's beautiful, but she's stuck up doing her own makeup. And we drag queens, we already do our own makeup. So we're very we're good. <laughs> That's right. You do your own makeup. You sew your own clothes. You do your own hair. Yeah. And now we're our own tech people. We have to like, you know, we have to figure out the, our own lighting, our own ring lights and our, our cameras, our microphones. You know, we have to press play and then like jump in front of the camera. So it, it's a completely different experience. But um, yeah, uh, we drag queens, we're, we're jack of all trades. Absolutely. Now, with all this free time on your hand, Manila, did you, you know, watch the, um, uh, the All Stars 5? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that during this quarantine, we've had just nonstop drag race. Um, yeah, I watched all of season 12. I watched all of All Stars 5. And now I'm currently watching Canada's Drag Race. Um, so um, we're like halfway through that. So like, I'm, I've am i been really, really enjoying it. It's like, it's like the one thing that's kind of been like my savior throughout this. Like I always like, okay, every week I have Drag Race to look forward to. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, I'm, we're halfway through Canada's Drag Race. So, like, after that, I don't know what we're going to do. 
I'm going to have to find something else to watch. I watched um, your season, you know, the All Stars 4. I binge watched it. I, oh, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it so much. And we want to come to that a little bit later. What did you think of uh, Shea Cooley winning All Stars 5? I kind of suspected that Shea Cooley was going to do very well. Um, and I thought, yeah, for sure, like she was definitely the front runner coming in, I thought, because watching her on season nine, um, she was fantastic. And um, I knew that she has like the fashion. She's very, um, she's very in tune with what's going on in the world. You know, like she's doing it much better than most drag queens like out there, out there working. So I, I had, a, I had a feeling I was rooting for my, my friend Jujubee the whole time. So, uh, because, you know, I've, I've known Jujubee and, you know, as like, you know, as an Asian drag queen, I'm, I'm always, I'm always supporting the Asian drag queens. Like I, I don't even care if they are terrible. I'm like, they're already, uh, you're Asian. Okay. You're at the top of my list. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was, I was definitely rooting for Juju B just because, you know, we're, we're close friends and we've been working together, um, you know, since, you know, she was on RuPaul's Drag Race season two. So, um, I was rooting for, for Juju B as well. So I, I was, but I was very happy when, when Shea Kula, I think she was well, well deserved for the crown. Uh, Manila, I want to just go back and, and talk about your early days in drag. And when did you have an interest in and with drag? Well, to be honest, I've always loved playing dress up. Like I loved like Halloween. I loved the idea of like theater and like putting on costumes. And I love uh, performance, live performance. Um, so as a, as a child, that was always something that kind of, like was part of like my play. You know, like that's how I would play, would, you know, like dress up and, you know, kind of make believe. And then I would also I would also draw a lot because um, before I wanted to be do, do any of this, I wanted to be an artist. So I would always draw and I used to like draw um, pictures of like costumes and, and fa fabulous hair. And so as I, even as a child, I would go into my, my mom's walk-in closet downstairs and I would like find, cause she threw, she didn't throw anything away. Like she had stuff from the the sixties and seventies, all every, every outfit, like just jam packed in this place. And I would pull out her coats and her dresses and I would try them on. And then like, there was a, there was a time that I was like the same size as my mother when she was like a petite young 20 something, you know? So <laughs> that's kind of where it started and then when i when i came out of the closet and was like i'm like okay i'm gay now how old were you when you came out from the closet i came out around 20 years old 20 years old um i feel like at the time i felt like i had waited way too long to come out um and it was like time to come out um but like looking back at it now like i'm almost twice my age twice my twice my age when i when i came out so it's like okay i guess i was ready when i was ready so um i came out but it was a difficult it was difficult for me when i when i first came out so what i ended up doing was like well i guess now i don't have to like pretend and i can you know I'm, everyone knows I'm gay now, so no harm in wearing a, a dress and a wig. So honestly, like that's when I first t started taking drag very seriously. I came up with my name, Manila Buzan, mm -hmm. uh, to honor my mother's home home place. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of used drag as my creative way to kind of just like get myself into this like gay world or this like gay lifestyle in, in a way and it, it really helped me kind of like come to terms with who I was um I, I grew up never really feeling like I was very attractive um and so being able to you know put on like paint my face and, and change up my hair and you know, change the shape of my body even with corsets and padding it, it was something that was like very liberating. And then when I took it all off, I, I still felt beautiful. So um, drag really helped define who I was. So it's been something that I've been doing for a, such a long time. And 
I owe a lot of my personality to the fact that I decided to do drag. That's wonderful. It's, it's very inspiring. So I just hope that, you know, other young people out there, or not even young people, you know, people who are still middle-aged and still, you know, afraid to, you know, admit or say, you know, come out and say things. So, you know, I hope this conversation inspires people not to be shameful or afraid. There's something very scary about just even the idea that your your family won't accept who you are and and or or the fact that like you have something wrong with you from what your family is ex- ex- expecting from you and it's and it can weigh a lot on you um what i found is that yeah it might be hard for your family to accept in the beginning ultimately everyone in my family i i just want them to be happy with who they are because like once you find out who you are like it suddenly every nothing really matters you know like i feel like it's something that's um this like aha moment when you are just like ah this is who i am with all of my flaws included you know and then it's like oh okay so now that i have accepted and i'm acknowledging these parts of myself you know nothing can hurt me you know, no one can say, oh, you're gay or, or use any kind of derogatory term of that to me because I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Call me whatever horrible thing you want to say to me. We can bleep it out. Um, but like, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm cool with that. You know, you're, <laughs> I'm not hiding it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I find it really great to see people coming out younger and younger. And to have families and mothers and fa- fathers uh, being supportive, even edge, edging on their their kids to like, hey, you wanna you wanna come out? <laughs> Before it was like, oh, if you saw that your kid was kind of gay, you'd like you know you would yell at them and say, no, don't do that. And now it's like, oh, if you kind of start to suspect that your child is gay, you're like, hey, so um, we're gonna watch Drag Race sometime. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a. The, the thing that breaks it all, right? Like, yeah, it's yeah. drag race for sure. I mean, that's I mean, that's how my husband kind of like uh, he he had his introduction uh, and a lot of that with with his father was through drag race. Your husband is Michael. My, my husband's Michael. Um, he's uh, born in the Bronx, um, Puerto Rican, Chilean descent. So um, yeah, I mean, we all have our own stories that somehow tie into RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> so back when you were, you know, starting out, there was not many people you could, you know, look up to for inspirations and in drag. Here in the States, we, we still don't have, like, a real proper, like, Asian pop star. We don't have, you know, Asian representation was something that I didn't get. And gay Asian representation was something that I didn't necessarily get a lot of. So it was very limited to what uh, I could turn to. Mm-hmm. And so, honestly, like, going on to RuPaul's Drag Race and, you know, representing myself as a gay Asian man, or a drag queen, um, I got to add to pop culture and, and that. And, you know, honestly, like, I've, I've met so many fans who have in, been inspired by that. And, you know, some are now even fabulous, famous drag queens. So I love that. That's definitely a great contribution you have, you know, done completely like unexpected because all I wanted to do was wear glamorous dresses and look pretty and sickening and crack some silly jokes. And that's honestly, I was doing all that for my own sake. And and to hear that uh, the side effect is that it's inspiring um, people all over to, you know, step their game up, you know, not be afraid of, you know, experimenting or being creative or expressing themselves. I think that it's like a, it's like a fun side effect to like just me going out and just like, you know, wanting to be Manila Luzon. <laughs> you know, by the way, I just love the name Manila Luzon. It's such a powerful name. It's just so, it identifies with you, you know, Manila and oh, yeah. know, Luzon. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I, I know, them. I know, you know, Luzon is, you know, an island in the Philippines. So, you know, but I think the, the play of words and how you combine them together just makes it even, you know, it was so exotic. 
well, if I'm naming myself after a city, if a geolo- uh, geographic location, I might as well just go full on. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, and, and it it has the same amount of syllables as Madonna. <laughs> Manila has okay. the same amount of syllables as Madonna. Okay. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, Manila, what's your story? How did you enter season three? How was the process like for you for RuPaul's Drag Race? Well, I always wanted to do drag, mm-hmm. you know, like you know, when I came out. And then I moved up to New York City and I, and I wanted to pursue my drag there. Um, I started out in like a, the, gay, the gay clubs in Minnesota where I'm from. And then I moved up to New York City and it was a very different experience. You know, New York City is like... Uh, very small and compact and you know you, like the the clubs are really they're smaller the drag shows were a lot smaller so um it was something that i didn't um pursue professionally um at first because you know for me getting in drag was like a hobby i had i was working as a graphic designer in new york and you know even though i had a creative job I was doing other people's work. So, you know, at the end, I would come home and then I would, you know, work on my costume or my look for some party that I would just attend and full drag and, and just go out to, like, have a good time. And I would just keep doing that. Like, maybe I'd go out and drag maybe, like, once a month in New York City. And then it started becoming a little bit more of a thing. Maybe, like, then it turned into, like, once a week. And... Um, then I started making friends with uh, drag queens in New York City. And, you know, like, I started doing, like, a bar, a pageant at a bar. And, um, you know, started competing in, like, amateur shows and stuff like that. But um, it, 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 I wasn't really taking it very seriously, even though it's something that I really loved to do. And I had, um, I had an an image in my mind that as an artist, I, I just found it so satisfying to like create it and the, the part of putting it together and making my outfit and making my painting my face and styling my hair. And, and then the final product was me being in it. And then I would go get wasted in a club. I take a bunch of pictures and then I would like it all fall off. And then I would look, look back at the pictures and I'll be like, yeah, that was a good, uh, that was like fun time. And then RuPaul's Drag Race came on TV and it changed the game. It, it changed how um, it kind of gave a, a purpose or, or, or a specific reason to, or, or, you know, to do my drag. Um, so then I auditioned for season three and then I, I got on and then it was like, oh, uh, okay. Um, and I'm very happy that I was able to get on season three because in the beginning it was, it was a very different tv show than it is now i think now it's like higher expectations bigger audiences like you know the bar has been raised um and so you when you go when you go back into the show nowadays you have to be very very like you know you have to be come in there with like full strategies and you know costumes and you know take out a loan so you could afford to get costumes custom made for you um but yeah, it was it was Drag Race that really kind of started my career. Up until that point, I was like, you know, being a guest performer on you know some show in, in a in a small gay bar. But now I was going onto TV and you know doing a reality TV show that was about drag. So it was like I was a drag queen, but I really wasn't like a working drag queen. So I kind of just was like able to kind of like try to figure it out because it's it's not just a like a drag pageant. It, it's a reality TV show. Yeah. So you, know, you have to kind of make good TV. Like, what do I like when I watch reality TV? You know, like, OK, let me try, you know, being silly and falling over and, you know, getting into a fight with someone and uh, having a having a fun time doing it all with glitter and and wigs. (laughs) You mentioned about, you know, reality TV. So there's, you know, there's the the dancing element, the makeup element, a lot of drama within it. Is it a scripted show or unscripted show? It's a completely unscripted show. I mean, there are parts where like, they'll give you like a script, like, oh, we're going to do an, we're going to do the skit. So you have to like learn some lines, but like, 
I don't know. It's it's reality TV, so it isn't a documentary about our lives as drag queens. It's kind of like if you think about it, it's like okay, it, you have to think of it as like a um, one of those shows where you have like a you know you have a bunch of athletes trying to like go over monkey bars and then they have to like try not to fall in the water and you know be a gladiator and you know like they have to do that kind of stuff so the the television show definitely does kind of set the par- parameters that you have to kind of go through and you have to dodge these things and they they're throwing twists at you so there are elements that have some control but like it's kind of random. They don't know how we're going to react. That's what makes it very interesting. So so you don't know about in All Stars 4, when the four queens came back, you know, the eliminated queens returned. Am I right to say you didn't know that was going to happen? No, I didn't know it was going to happen. Um, I mean, you can always suspect things, you know, ha- having watched, you know, the show has been on the air now for over like like 12, 12 years now or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 15 years. Um, we've had like, like 15, 16 seasons or the spinoff shows. So we all kind of know that there's always the possibility of like, oh, someone could be brought back, you know, some, you know, there's like a twist, someone gets disqualified, some, you know, you have to do, who knows what's, what's going to go on. So yeah, I think it's always kind of like a, you know, you never know what's going to happen. When you're in the workroom, how do you concentrate when you have cameras all around you? I mean, is there, how does that work? I mean, you know, you have to do your costumes, you have to do your makeup, you have to prepare for your skits, you have to do your lip sync, you know, practice your lip sync battle, right? The songs that you're going to lip sync to. How does it work when you have a camera with a group, I mean, a camera crew? Well, it actually makes it a lot easier because, you know, we're all drag queens and we love attention. So you point a camera at a drag queen, she's going to give you a show. That's just how it works. I and I I don't know if it's if it's true for everyone. Like when you put a camera in front of them, but like for us drag queens, that's that's when we turn on. And when the camera guy says, "Okay, I'm gonna go on my break," we just stop talking. <laughs> it's not hard to understand. I mean, when you have a camera in front, you're gonna like ham it up for the camera. Um, you won't you won't usually get. You only get into fights with your other drag queens if there's a camera pointed at you. There's been times when you kind of start getting into a heated, heated argument with another queen and you look over and you realize that the cameraman is not pointed at you and you have to be like, hey, we're about to fight over here. Why don't you like look at us for a while? I mean, it's kind of one of those things. You know, like as as you do it, and I've, and I've done it several times now because I was on three seasons of it, um, you, you forget that the camera's there when you're doing it. But you also never forget the cameras there because, you know, obviously, like, you know, when I watch it back, I want to have, like, a good angle. <laughs> so you, like, you always know where to look, right? <laughs> and you enjoy it. You seem just to enjoy it, you know, all the time. So it's your third time, right? Yeah, that's where you that's where you get to shine. That's where you get to be who you ever, whoever you are. And it's crazy. It, 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 it heightens emotions, especially, too. So, like, when you feel like... When you feel like screaming, you scream. When you feel like crying, you you almost feel like, yeah, well, I'm feeling these emotions. And if I hold them in, no one watching is going to understand what I'm going through. So let me just let it out. So when I'm having a good time, I'm having a good time. When I'm sitting there crying because I, I feel bad, it's because I'm, I feel bad. Um, and when you're getting into a fight with someone, it's because you you want to just get that out. I mean... You could get all zen and be like, okay, it's not going to bother me. You know, the episode that you were eliminated, um, you had your husband perform in drag, and both of you performed um, a Judy Garland song. Now, as you look back, Manila, what could you have done differently for the Judy challenge to have avoided the elimination? All I know is that like, when I was there... I knew, well, I know I'm very familiar with my husband's face. So I just wanted to make sure that he was beautiful. And I think that I did a great job. I think that, I think that, um, his makeup looked amazing and stunning. Um, I don't know. I honestly, like, I, I, I don't think that I could have done anything differently because like, you know, maybe the costumes weren't what they wanted from me. Um, but 
it was at that point it was too late. I was already there, already brought the costumes, so I couldn't really, you know, do anything about it. It's not like I could just run out to a, a store and, and go shopping for the for the both of us to get a cuter outfit. Um, but no, I, I mean, I thought that our concept was was good, and I think that our presentation was great, and you know, I think that when we did our little Judy dance. It was a, a fun time. And I think that, um, I think that in, in my experience, I think that what I was portraying was, was our truth. Um, getting, having people get to see me and my husband interact was very special for me. One of the things that having your husband come into the episode, into the workroom with you is that, you know, when we're filming this show, we're like sequestered. They take away your phones, your laptops, um, and anything that you do is just drag race, you know? Like, so for that, for the time that you're filming the season, the only thing you're thinking about is RuPaul's Drag Race. So to have my husband come back, it was a lot of fun, but it also like what opened up the window, and I all of a sudden realized that, oh yeah, like, I'm in a bubble right now and there's a whole world that's happening outside and that once this bubble's over i get to go back out into that world and be you know like be myself in the real world without being in this confined you know like on the on the sound stage or being sequestered in my hotel with the same people so i think that a little bit of my concentration and focus was, um, you know, you know, I was not as focused as much, but I don't know. I couldn't have asked for uh, a better way to go out um, because, it, well, it, especially because like my husband was actually there in, in the space so that like, I didn't have to pack up all my stuff alone. <laughs> he actually, he, he was very helpful and he did all the packing well, I kind of was just like, I can't believe this happened. Oh my gosh. Did you expect somehow, you know, during that season that you would have been brought back somehow a twist? I mean, did you think at the back of your mind what was going through RuPaul's head and maybe... Because I think RuPaul was kind of surprised that, you know, you were eliminated. So was there... Did you think there could be a slight chance or a possibility... I didn't think so because we already had the the episode where we brought the queens back. So if I was to be brought back, I would have had to be kicked off the show a lot sooner. And it got to that point where I knew that if I ever landed in the bottom, that I knew going into this into the into the season of All Stars as a as a queen who already did a season of All Stars because I was on the first season of All Stars with Latrice Royale. I already knew coming in that I was a larger threat and a, and a bigger target for Queens, you know, um, on season one of all stars, it was still the judges that sent us home, but now the, the format had changed where we send each other home. It was just in the back of my head all the time that if I was ever in the bottom, I would probably be sent home because I'm not an idiot. I knew I was, uh, kicking ass, you know, in fact, in the beginning of the season, I was holding back a lot in the first few episodes because I didn't want to come in too strong because, you know, so I didn't want to paint a bigger target on my back. So I, I even held back a little bit. So, yeah, it was it was one of those things where I always knew that, like, if I was ever going to be in the bottom, like, I mean, I would have voted myself out. I, I, I thought <laughs> I would have voted myself out, too. So... I don't blame anyone for it. You know, Manila, when you joined the competition, what expectations did you have of yourself? Well, first of all, I, I had no idea that I would even be able to come back and compete. Because having done season three, and then a few years later being asked to be an all-star on the first season of All-Stars, I thought like, okay, this is like, now I am being recognized not only as, you know, a fabulous drag queen, not only as, you know, the, the runner up of my season, but now I'm considered an all-star, one of the favorites from the last four seasons of drag race. Like, you know, because all stars happened after season four. So they had four seasons to choose from for the girls. So I felt honored to be part of that. 
So then a few years later, like, you know, it took a few more seasons before they did All Stars 2, you know, and then they started doing an All Star season kind of like every year. So I don't, we have so many drag queens that have been on the show. Some of them are amazing, and there are some queens that I'm just dying to see more of. Um, so when I was asked to be back on the show, I, I thought, did everyone else say no? Like, <laughs> Why are you asking me? Like, I already was an all-star. I'm fine. So, uh, yeah, I guess, like, when I go, went back, enough time had passed between when I was first on my seasons um, because season three and all-stars happened fairly, like, fairly close to each other. And now several years have passed. The show has been moved from, like, the Logo Network to the larger network, VH1, in America. And then it got onto Netflix, Manila. And then it, yeah, it's been on Netflix, so it's all over the world. And I, I was just really excited that I would have another opportunity to come back on the show, having myself as a drag queen grow so much, but also to come back onto the show, which has grown so much. You know, the, the show is winning Emmys at that point. I mean, it's like part of uh, pop culture vernacular. We have people quoting the show that you wouldn't think would actually be uh, like would watch drag, but now it's just like integrated so much into pop culture. So getting to go back onto the season was a fantastic, it was a fantastic opportunity. So I jumped at the opportunity and, you know, because I've been working so hard and um, since I was on the show, I had a lot to, a lot of growth to show um, with my, with my style um, and also had, had saved up a lot of more money. So I had a little bit more of a budget and oh, honey, I spent a fortune on my, on my costumes and my wigs and my jewelry and even my boy clothes were expensive. So I just wanted to put my best foot forward because I knew that this opportunity doesn't come very often. I, how many people can say lightning strike strikes three times. And then also having lost the show two times before. Like there was no, you know, like the pressure's off, you know, because I, 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 f I feel like um, I'm doing big things and I haven't even won the show. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you win the show. So that's kind of like where I came from. Like if I got kicked off first, I was going to make it a, the, a memorable experience and I was going to do like the most I could in the given time that I had. So that's kind of how I went into it, you know. I didn't have to win the show, but, you know, the, the money would have been nice. I made that money up, you know, mm -hmm. on my own accord, you know, like, I don't have to get handouts from famous drag queens. Absolutely. I can go out there and earn it myself, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. You've and earned honestly, it. You've, you've earned it, you know, Manila, with all your amazing talent, you know, you, you got a comedy side, I have to say. So is comedy something you're going to go into, you think? Oh, well, I do love make jokes and I like to be funny. I mean, definitely. I, I think that's the, the coolest thing about, you know, being on the show was the fact that, you know, like, oh, so now you're going to, you know, you're going to be a news reporter now. Oh, I've never been, I never thought I would be delivering news. I never thought that I'd be reading a, a teleprompter. I never thought that I would be the person that would be interviewing uh, celebrities. You know, I, I didn't expect to be, you know, like, I, you know, kind of think like, oh, well, you know, it's just putting on makeup doing a little dance and a lip sync number. That's what you thought. But now I'm like, okay, now I'm doing more uh, on, on all stars. They had us interior decorating. Now, I, hell, I could make it a, that a whole business if I wanted to. We do these acting challenges on RuPaul's Drag Race. Now, now I'm auditioning for, for roles on TV and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a guest spot on, on General Hospital soap opera, and <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing a cameo on AJ and the Queen on Netflix with RuPaul. Uh, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. Like in them doing things that I, I I never thought that I would ever get to do, but because of RuPaul's Drag Race, I get to do it. So I mean, who knows what other opportunities come along? You know kind of cool definitely and you got a podcast now with latrice royale yes i got a podcast now and i never thought ever that i would i don't even listen to podcasts and people are saying hey so we want you to do a podcast it's actually alaska and willem um they are you know they're they're starting their own podcast you know 
company, umbrella company, and, and um, through the success of their own two podcasts, like now we're branching out. And so we're, you know, creating more jobs for the sisters. And it's easy for me, like, to go and, you know, recap a, an episode of Drag Race. You know, I was the host of Pit Stop last year um, for season 11. So, like, this is like, this is like an easy thing to do. How did you team up with Latrice Royal on this uh, podcast? Can you tell us about it? Well, I mean, Latrice and I have always been close because when we were on All Stars the first season, when they made us choose partners and Latrice and I were partners. And that honestly was like the greatest thing that I got out of the first season of All Stars was forging this friendship with with someone who's very different from me, but is also very similar to me. You know, and, and we have totally different lives, but we just you know, we just can come together and have a good old time. We had um, collaborated on a few songs together. We've, we've, uh, we, after uh, we did our song, The Chop, um, which our podcast is named after. And then um, on, on my latest um, record, um, Rules, which I came out after All Stars, she was on my, she was featured on my song, The Chop. And then like right you know, like last month, I, I had uh, dropped the video for that, which was like a fully animated video, which took over a year to make. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, it's just like my little um, um, track with her. So yeah, I, I, I love working with her. And, you know, we, we were always FaceTiming and kikiing anyway. So we might as well like put a microphone, record it and make some money. <laughs> and, you know, you mentioned about the animated music video. It was just phenomenal. I enjoyed it. Uh, robbed, right? It was a fun experience because I didn't have to get in drag for, <laughs> to shoot this music video because someone just drew the whole thing, you know? Uh, uh, it took a long time to do it, but, you know, like with Latrice and um, like she lives on the other side of the country. She lives in Florida. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles and California, um, you know, and we're busy. We're both touring around the world on our uh, own schedules. So it's hard to get us together. It was hard enough just to get her to come into the studio to record her part of the track. Um, So to do a music video was going to be difficult. And the idea of my music video was just so complex because I wanted it to be like this full on adventure. Um, And, you know, so decided that we would make it a an animated video. I like to keep my my nice girl image, even though I can be very shady. Um, I wanted to explore my villainous side. Um, you know, like I, I love, I always like kind of tend to lean towards like the villain. Like I'm, I'm more of an Ursula fan than I am of an Ariel fan in the little mermaid. You know, I, I love, you know, how evil Jafar is in Aladdin. You know, I, I kind of love the fact that now we have movies like Maleficent, which kind of focuses on the bad guy, you know, or like movies like, um, birds of prey of, with Harley Quinn, like we are now making our hero, like the anti-hero. So I wanted to try something with that. And I thought that, you know, like I wanted to play a character, but you know, it's really, really hard for people to, to kind of make a distinction between me as a person and me as a character, because I'm kind of already playing a character, but that character is kind of myself in a way. So I'm not acting as a someone. I'm kind of like, it's complicated. So I wanted to make, I wanted to be a badass villain. I wanted to go on a freaking like robbery and heist with, with an adventure. Maybe your manager can pitch it to Disney or something, you know? We're kind of in the works. I mean, everyone, everyone now wants like to like see like the, the movie now or the, or the, the cartoon series. So it's something that definitely could, is, is up in the air right now and in talks. So hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed, legs crossed. <laughs> You've just, you know, one talented queen for sure. One talented queen. And, you know, I want to, I don't know whether you you recall, but um, in 2016, we had you out here in Singapore. Yes, for RuPaul's Drag Race Battle of the Seasons. Yes. I see the poster right there. Yeah. That was my second time in Singapore. That was the last time I was in Singapore. I need to come back. What was your first reaction when you heard that the tour was coming to Singapore, the Battle of the Seasons tour? Uh, I had already been to Singapore a year or two beforehand, so I was very excited to go back. And I was also very excited to go with my Drag Race sisters. 
because um, you know I'm not I'm not from Singapore, uh, but whenever I go to Asia, I just feel like I'm this much closer and I have this much more understanding of like my heritage and where I come from and, and my Filipino background. Um, so getting to go to Asia is a lot of fun. And I felt really, I, I felt really honored to be able to share that with my drag race sisters, because I know most of them hadn't been there. A, a lot of, a lot of Queens don't come out to Singapore. So it was really exciting to go out there and y'all bowled out the red carpet it was, uh, we got to descend from a big staircase. Oh for my our God, you remember that? All of our adoring fans, they're waiting and clapping as we, we came down like Rose and the Titanic, just down those grand staircase of the theater. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was great to experience an, uh, um, an audience from a completely different culture, you know, uh, and to see um, how far our reach is. To, it goes across... The world and it's it's amazing it was one of the best um times i had for me you know oh, i had so much fun manila i i still remember you coming down you know the stairs you know it was such i still have such good memories you know of that time you know it was such an impactful it was such i mean we didn't even at that time rupaul's drag race was not even on television on the network yeah, and I've been touring for a long time into different countries, and it's it's not an uncommon story for me because I've always been hearing like, y'all don't even have this show airing in your country. It's not in Netflix. Y'all, everyone has to like watch it from some like dark web underground like link, you know. Like, and it 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 feels it feels great to have such a dedicated uh, fan base, and and to go to a completely different country where everything is different is is amazing to, to see that drag is a common denominator and that we can relate to it and, and that's like the first step into seeing how much we are similar with each other i don't know whether you recall but when we kind of started promoting the tour we had michelle visage on the artwork and uh, we kind of promoted her along with um, you know, the other queens. And I was looking back at all, you know, all my chorus, all the correspondences and all our social media posts. And suddenly, you know, uh, some at some point, Mich- Michelle Visage dropped off from the tour. So I didn't know whether she was supposed to be on the tour. And- uh, yeah, she was supposed to be on the tour. There was times when we were doing some of our shows that we were like, should we still be? I, I think there was maybe like some mass shootings or something. I'm not. Oh yeah, sure. the club, the Pulse Club, right? Oh, it was Pulse. That's what it was. Yes, I remember. It we were, Pulse. we were shocked. It was a huge, devastating thing that shook us to our core. Mm-hmm. It was Pulse because um, in June we, it happened. I guess I remember it yeah, was June. We had it right before we came out. Yeah, and that was a big deal for us because we all knew people that lost their lives and um, it, it, it scared a lot of us because we have kind of, we've created this fantasy bubble that we all live in and, and we've created this safe space that we invite anyone off the street, come on in, see this drag show, come on into our club. We're, you know, we're the people that got shit on by society. So we'll accept anyone. So come on into our space and let's all have fun for, for, for one night. Let's just drink, party, do drag, you know, make out a little bit. Um, and then this disaster happened and all of a sudden, like we get scared. I think that's I think that's kind of what um, it, it kind of broke up the tour a little bit, and it, we almost didn't even do the show. It was just so hard for us to process, and we didn't know what to do, and we didn't know if we could celebrate and we could party anymore, you know. And it was it was that it was that it, it just shook us all to our our center, and and it, it made us reevaluate a lot of things and i think that's really when like i think when michelle visage uh stopped hosting the tour unfortunately for for our singapore audience we 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 didn't get michelle visage but we did have ginger minge host she was fantastic because she's such a good host and we still had a good time and um 
And because uh, Mich- Michelle Visage was uh, a vegan, we actually didn't have to worry about her <laughs> dietary restrictions anymore. <laughs> so we got to like go to Singapore and just eat whatever we wanted to without having, you know, <laughs> Michelle Visage's strict uh, diet to worry about. <laughs> And then, you know, after you know, after we broke the news that Michelle couldn't make it for the tour, we had to break the news of some of Queens falling off the tour. Um, you know, Alaska couldn't come and um Pandora. I think Pandora also did not make it. And it's always a problem. There's like I think someone's passport was expiring and it didn't allow enough time. For Singapore, they, you you guys are very strict out there. Six months. You have, a, you have a beautiful country, so you guys want to make sure that no one's trying to trying to sneak in. Um, I think there was some passport issues, and that's just like stuff that we you know since it was our first time taking the tour out to Singapore. You know, there's a lot of things that we 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 don't plan for or, or think of, and you know we're all busy queens, and you know like we we try really hard to bring on a put a good show on it, and of course you know like. Also, the tours, we, the the queens, we were alternating different cities. Like the cast would change a little bit. So it was for us. It was just like an unfortunate uh, uh, event when we came out to Singapore. But for me, it made me like try harder to make up for the fact that you didn't get your Michelle Visage or your Alaska or Thank your Pandora. Thank you, Manila. Thank you. It really paid off because that was my first introduction to, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race of bringing a tour. Before that, oh, I think yeah. I, I think before that only a door had a small show in a club. I had come out there like a couple years ahead. Um, I was in that club that's like you know the Louis Vuitton store that's in the water, right? What the, the club that's right next uh, to it? Okay, that was um, it was used to be known as Avalon. Avalon. That's it was Avalon when I went there, and that was so much fun oh mm. my gosh i had so much fun and and then also like i think the next day was the um the pink party or or what, what's that yeah, event uh, that pink, pink dot pink, pink dot yeah and that was a lot of fun and i was up in a hotel looking down at the square looking at all the beautiful lights and you know it, it, it was it was an event that was um getting bigger and bigger each year so i i can't i kind of want to go back and see like you know when this is all done and over with like you know how much brighter pink dot is going to be um i was really really excited to come back to to singapore yeah because there weren't that many queens so i was really happy that we all got to come in there with a big show and now i i think i think work the world tour comes through there Mm -hmm. um so now it's like you know it's like old but like the to be the first yeah it's 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 really fun to to kind of pave the way it was really game changing, you know, and then it led the way for other, you know, queens to come out because then we knew there was an audience. It was not something that, oh, we like, oh, I only liked and I, you know, I bought the show. So, you know, Manila, it was just, I was, I'm grateful for that opportunity. I'm really yeah, grateful. I mean, drag is, drag is such like a wonderful uh, thing that I think a lot of people can kind of get into because it is really dr- uh, it is really uh, glamorous. It it doesn't take itself seriously because you're like, oh, it's like a, that's like a, a dude in a dress, you know. Um, it's inspiring to see what you can, you know, how you can make nothing look like a million bucks. Um, it's fun to play in the fantasy. It's fun to to you know play with makeup and hair, and it inspires you know the audience as well and it's there's nothing like going to a live drag show there's nothing like it in the world and to go there and also see like some of the local drag queens coming to support like that's exciting because you know I, i've done that where i've come to a a, a city you know or a country and i see the local queens and you know they and then when i come back like they're the stars they're the ones hosting the show next, you know? So it's, it's cool to see. I I can't wait to come back to Singapore um, when it's safe to finally. Yes, definitely. We are, I mean, this whole, you know, the show, when we put it out, you're going to get, you know, the fans excited for the future. Yeah. And until then, you know, like we, we're still doing, you know, drag shows. It's just a little different. It's just like on your phone, it's on your computer, you're streaming it live now. It's, it's a, it's a different experience, but um, it's, it's still 
a great experience because, you know, like drag queens, we don't have the stage anymore at the bar or the club. So now our homes are our stage. And we, we as drag queens, we're not just, you know, putting on a wig and stepping on stage. No, we're putting on a wig and making backdrops in our houses. We, we, <laughs> we have, we, we're buying little like lights that flash so that when we're performing, it feels like a club. We just want to make sure that uh, we love to have an audience and we, we really appreciate the people that tune in to our, you know, Facebook lives or our digital drag shows. And before RuPaul's Drag Race, you know, you would have to go to a, a gay nightclub. Now, then it was like, now you can watch it on your TV. Then it was like, oh, you can go to a theater and watch a full production. Last year, the New York magazine ranked you number 19 in their top 100 drag race superstar. What was your reaction to that? Uh, yeah, I do, I do remember that. Um, it was, it's fine. I mean, it's, I mean, I know that like, we we came into existence in a, for, for a lot of people in a competition setting. So I feel like it's really hard for us to kind of shake that down after the fact. So to always being compared to each other in this kind of like fight for, you know, the top is always kind of uh, something that we can't get away from. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you do get on a list, you're, as long as you're not the last one, I feel like I'm, I'm a winner. <laughs> and the fact that I'm in top 20, I, I feel very honored. I feel very honored. And, um, you know, I'm not everyone's top top 19, you know. some I'm actually number one in some people's minds. Mm -hmm. And some people are the last on their list. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's uh, all about who's publishing it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's always an honor. Anytime I can get in a magazine, I am so happy. In fact, actually, um, it was uh, right after RuPaul's Drag Race Battle of the Seasons in Singapore when several of us queens did a photo shoot for Singapore's uh, Harper's magazine. Right. Yes. Yes. I, I remember that. I remember that. And that was that was a fantastic day and a fantastic shoot. And we we got to wear some really high end ex expensive clothes you know like i'm a drag queen so i'm used to wearing you know the same uh the same sequin dress that's falling apart and you know smells smells like my sweat and, and perfume and to put on like these you know glamorous outfits you know from the highest end designers was was, was such a treat and to and to get to do a, a photo shoot with some of my queens and a bunch of professional models who were all, I think, under 20 years old. <laughs> it, was crazy. it was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, in America, no one's putting us on in magazines. So to, when we come to Singapore and we're being put in a legitimate fashion magazine, it was it was definitely a highlight of my career. Um, and it was and it was in Singapore. It was a lot of fun. We, we all got to have like our little moment. Um, and, you know, we had like some very, very beautiful young ladies who like, I, and I, I don't photograph next to women because women are just so beautiful. And uh, these models were gorgeous. And I felt like a giant seven foot tall truck driver next to them. But it was, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to like, you know, be there and like have a little party and have a, a it photographed for this for this uh, shoot for Harper's. Just um, final words for your fans in Asia. I feel like um, I, I I'm not going to get to see my fans in Asia for a while, um, but I'm so excited to return. Um, until then, I want everyone to please be safe and. Um, and and to stay healthy um and to make the best out of the situation and um, still you know be creative um I, I know like the world outside is crazy um social media is is not a true representation of of the outside world even though that's all we have i feel like but i can't wait to come back and to get to uh share in the energy of the fans out there in asia i it's it's my favorite place to go. Um, I feel like 
I'm at home, even though I, I don't live there or, or I'm even from Singapore, but it's just, it's just lovely to come and I can't wait. So hopefully kids, I'll see you soon. Manila, thank you so much for allowing yeah. us, you know, this opportunity to chat with you and uh, we wish you all the best. And we definitely, definitely look forward to having you when things resume. For sure. Put me at the top of the list, or at least top 20. <laughs> Definitely. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Manila Luzon. And we wish Manila all the best for her future and affairs. And we hope to bring her to Singapore very soon. Now, if you enjoy watching the show and you would like regular updates, you can follow us at wordsandmusic.com and also at lacomedylive.com. We also have this version of the show on a podcast, which you can find on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcast. So until next time, for Words and Music, my name is Loretta Alabons. Thank you. Thank you.